Ethan was going through the park when he spotted a cosy bench by the lonely fountain. Feeling the need for a break, he decided to sit down. People walked back and forth along the road. Some hurried about their business, while others leisurely strolled. Smiling young mothers pushed strollers, and small children rode scooters and bicycles. It was an idyllic picture. All this brought back memories of a beautiful park in the centre of a small town where he spent his childhood. Ethan's mother worked a lot, so his grandmother took care of him until the fifth grade. They would often visit the park, feeding the birds and having conversations about anything and everything. As Ethan thought about his grandmother, a sad but grateful smile crossed his face. She was perhaps the closest and dearest person to him. She died when Ethan was already a university student in his third year, and it took him a long time to come to his senses. Later, he often reminisced about her, especially during significant moments in his life. She had noticed his knack for math early on, even before he started school. Ethan has a brilliant mind. I think he can be a talented engineer, and then a great future will be ahead of him, the woman would proudly declare. She'd worked in architecture all her life, so she knew what she was talking about. Ethan's mother would simply smile. She thought her mother praised Ethan out of her blind love, but Ethan did indeed turn out to be a talented mathematician. It became evident in the first grade. While other children struggled with basic operations, Ethan solved problems of increased complexity, meant for fourth graders. The teacher assigned him additional tasks to keep him interested during lessons. Ah, it's a pity your grandfather can't see what you've become, the grandmother would sigh, looking at yet another diploma Ethan had earned from the city's mathematics competition. Ethan's grandfather had passed away a few months after his birth. The grandfather was a surgeon, enthusiastic, attentive and thoughtful. He was loved and respected in their town. He died right at his workplace. He became dizzy, his eyes darkened, and his chest was constricted. He was immediately taken to the cardiology department, but they couldn't save him. The grandmother often shared stories about her husband, creating a vivid and realistic image in Ethan's mind, so in a way Ethan's grandfather remained present in his life. But his father? Ethan knew nothing about him. As he grew older he began to ask questions, longing for a male figure to be by his side. His grandmother and mother, though wonderful and caring, could not fill that role. Ethan yearned for someone to talk to about masculine topics, to play sports with, and to discuss problems with. For a long time, both his mother and grandmother evaded his questions. "'It's not my secret,' his grandmother would say. As for his mother, she would either change the subject or claim to be busy. But one day she finally gave up. He left me when he found out I was pregnant. He ran away, that's all. The usual story. He was from out of town. He said he was from the capital, but who knows. He was working here. He told me plenty of lies, then disappeared. All I know about him is his name and city of residence. After he left, I realised I was waiting for you. I also realised that I'd leave the baby behind no matter what. My parents supported me, the mother sighed. After a few months, he appeared here again. He called me and asked me out. When he saw my rounded belly, he ran away. He was scared. You know, I didn't blame him. But I'm glad to have you. Well, that's about it. It's not a pretty story, so I don't want you to ask any more questions about it. Ethan was old enough to understand that it was hard for his mother to remember those times, because it turned out that she had behaved too frivolously. However, since then, the boy had stopped dreaming about the long-awaited meeting with his father, and stopped imagining him as a hero, a pilot, a long-distance sailor, a military man. His mother's confession freed the boy from illusions. Ethan lived with his grandmother until he was eleven or twelve, then he moved in with his mother. She rented an apartment not far from the math high school, and it was more convenient to get to school from his mother's place. But still, Ethan went to his beloved granny every weekend. He missed her, his room, his cat, and the atmosphere that reigned in the apartment where his childhood passed. 
Soon, Ethan fell in love with a girl named Kim. They were in different classes, but they had physical education at the same time. Ethan did not shine in sports. In all subjects in his diary there were A's, but in physical education he was a loser. Kim was impossible not to notice. She was tall, slender, light and graceful, like a panther. Straight nose, dark eyebrows apart, plump, beautifully curved lips, and huge eyes of some unreal turquoise colour. Kim was a beauty, and she knew it very well. The girl hung around mostly popular boys, who were handsome, athletic, self-confident, and had an excellent sense of humour. Ethan had never been like that. But he had other advantages. The boy quickly became one of the best mathematicians in the school. His grandmother was right. Ethan's talent really opened in the walls of a specialised school in full measure. Teachers praised him, practised with him additionally, and gave him tasks of increased complexity. Then one day Kim approached him at recess. Hi, she smiled radiantly. My name's Kim. We have physical education with your class at the same time. Do you remember me? Ethan weakly nodded, unable to utter a word due to his emotions. You see, Kim continued hesitantly, the mathematician gave us a difficult homework assignment. I didn't understand anything, and it will affect my final grade. My mother will be furious. Please, help me. Ethan was not only willing to solve the homework for Kim, but he was also ready to move mountains. He agreed without hesitation, eager to see the joy in the girl's turquoise eyes. Thank you, Kim exclaimed. You're really cool. That's what the girls in your class say about you. After that, Kim and Ethan did not become friends, but Ethan suddenly began to exist for her. She always greeted him, and sometimes they exchanged glances during physical education class. In high school, Kim started dating Paul, the captain of the local soccer team. That year, there were many couples at school, perhaps due to their age. Ethan felt an unpleasant feeling of jealousy when he saw them together. He knew he was still in love with Kim, and the childish feeling had not disappeared. Ethan wasn't interested in other girls, although some of his classmates clearly sympathised with him. If he had shown even the slightest initiative, they would have gladly gone on a date with him. But all his thoughts revolved around the unattainable Kim. Ethan rejoiced when rumours spread that Paul had left Kim for an older girl. In retaliation, Kim almost immediately started dating a guy who was also older than her. He picked her up after school in his own car. He was handsome and stylish. Every day, with eyes shining with happiness, Kim stepped into the cabin of the beautiful car, waiting for her at the school parking lot, and the couple drove away. The girls gossiped that Kim's new boyfriend was the son of very wealthy parents, and, of course, they envied her deep in their hearts. Lucky Kim. He's crazy about her. They'll get married when she turns 18. Kim got a ticket to a happy life. She doesn't need to study. She'll have all the money she wants. At that age, most girls dreamed of meeting a prince, a man who would shower them with expensive gifts and fulfil all their desires, just like in the movies. They didn't realise that free cheese was only in a mousetrap. Ethan felt like a pauper compared to Kim's new admirer. He had a car and rich parents. And what did Ethan have? He was just an ordinary guy. Meanwhile, life went on. Ethan graduated from high school and went to university. He had heard that Kim had actually married that guy as soon as she turned 18 and didn't pursue her studies. Her father-in-law had set her up in his company as a secretary. Kim received a fabulous salary, drove her new fancy car, lived with her husband in a luxurious apartment in the city centre, and often went on vacations abroad. In short, she had fulfilled the collective dream of the local girls. His studies saved him, courses, exams, projects, and finally he got a reward. He, as a promising young specialist, was taken on an internship at a large oil company. It was not easy to get a job there, but many people aspired to work there 
because the salaries were three or four times higher than the average in the region. At first, Ethan was both glad and overwhelmed when he received his first paycheck, but he had been working hard, so it was fair. It seemed that Ethan had forgotten about Kim. The memories of their first childhood love were gone, as were the torment and worry that their union was impossible. Ethan even started dating a girl, and their relationship quickly became serious. Nina was studying at the same university, just a year younger. They met for the first time at a student conference. Nina was sweet, kind, and open-minded. She was very intelligent and passionate about modern architecture. Ethan knew that Nina truly loved him. He could see it in her eyes and feel it in her touch. It was a surprisingly pleasant feeling to know that someone loved him so sincerely. However, Ethan himself did not feel the same intense emotions for Nina. It was not like what he had experienced in school with Kim. Ethan respected Nina, and he wanted to take care of her. He enjoyed making her happy and seeing a smile on her face. They agreed on important matters, often understood each other without words, and even finished each other's sentences. It was a complete harmony. For Ethan, it seemed like more than enough. The feelings he had for Kim in school were just teenage passions. Adults experience the world differently, and that's normal. The important thing was that he felt good and calm with Nina. The couple didn't rush into getting married. It was a mutual decision. They were already happy together. First, they both wanted to establish themselves in their careers and stand on their own two feet before starting a family. Neither Nina, Ethan, nor their mutual friends doubted that they would eventually get married. It was a given. After his internship, Ethan was offered a full-time position at the same oil company. His salary increased, and the volume and complexity of his tasks grew as well. When Nina received her diploma, she, as a young and promising graduate, was gladly accepted into an architectural firm recommended by the rector. Her eyes sparkled with delight as she told Ethan about her new job, and he understood her excitement. Nina moved in with Ethan. By that time, he had bought an apartment with a mortgage and even renovated it. They lived like a real family, and of course, they planned to have a wedding. They mutually agreed to postpone having children for now, but they wanted to formalize their relationship. Nina dreamed of a summer wedding. She wanted to wear a light white dress, have a photo session outdoors, and celebrate by the bank of a nearby wide river. Ethan liked all of Nina's ideas. However, after all, this didn't interest him too much. To be honest, his thoughts were mainly occupied with another big project. In February, Nina went to visit her parents in a neighboring city for a while. She had planned to stay with them for an extended period, and she suddenly had a week off. So she took the opportunity. That day, Ethan and his colleagues received funding from the company's management. For an important project, someone suggested celebrating the occasion, and Ethan agreed with pleasure. After the tense and nerve-wracking negotiations, they decided to go to a bar in the city center. Carl, one of Ethan's colleagues and close friends, assured that the bar had the best live music, the most delicious beer, and the most beautiful girls. No objections were raised. The bar was bustling with activity. With almost all the tables and seats occupied, however, for Carl, a regular at the bar, the administrator managed to find a small sofa in the corner. The group settled down comfortably and engaged in lively conversation, jokes, and laughter. They felt like winners and made plans for the funds they had worked hard to get, dreaming that their new idea would bring them substantial profits. Suddenly, Ethan couldn't believe his eyes. He spotted Kim. Memories from their youth flooded his mind, causing his head to spin and his pulse to quicken. Even though he was a grown and established man, he felt the profound influence she had on him. It seemed that his feelings for her had not diminished or changed over time. It was unbelievable. When Ethan noticed Kim, she was standing at the counter, engaged in a conversation with a waitress. The two exchanged smiles, indicating a friendly relationship between them. Kim, 
Her smile was captivating. Her long hair, the color of milk chocolate, cascaded freely on her shoulders. Her turquoise eyes, set on a beautiful tanned face, still shone with a certain allure, but now there was an elusive quality to them, perhaps hidden sadness or anxiety. Ethan hadn't noticed this during their school years. Kim was dressed in an emerald knitted dress, showcasing her slender legs, paired with bulky winter sneakers, creating a semi-sporty and elegant image. Kim then moved further into the corner of the hall with the waitress, becoming invisible from where Ethan was sitting. He didn't want to lose sight of her, so he quickly got up and followed the girls. Ethan managed to catch a glimpse of Kim slipping into the back room, so he decided to wait. He knew that sooner or later she would come out, and their encounter was inevitable. But what would he say to her? Ethan didn't know, and he was filled with worry and anxiety, going over casual and non-committal phrases in his head. Finally, the door opened, and Kim almost jumped into Ethan's arms. He was not expecting to see her like this. Kim was dressed in the uniform of the bar's waitstaff, a black t-shirt, tight black jeans, a grey apron, and a name badge reading Kim on her chest. Is she a waitress? How is that possible? ran through Ethan's mind. She's married to a wealthy man and supposed to live a glamorous social life, not running around the bar with trays. The woman was about to pass Ethan when he finally got the courage to call her out. Kim, is that really you? She stopped and carefully examined him from head to toe, and a hint of recognition appeared in her eyes. Kim suddenly seemed embarrassed, awkwardly smiled and replied, Yes, it's me, and you're Ethan, right? Yes. Wow, you've become such a man. What do you mean? Kim charmingly smiled. She was no longer shy. Back in school, you were a typical nerd, long and thin, not particularly attractive, but you know, time often works wonders for men like you. Ethan blossomed at this compliment. Kim had clearly expressed her sympathy. It was incredible. Ethan's self-confidence and strength immediately returned to him. What about you? Are you working here? Ethan asked. As you can see, Kim sighed and the smile faded from her face. Life is a strange and unpredictable thing. Who would have thought it would turn out like this? What had happened? It's not a pretty story, but I always say that everything happens for the best, even when it doesn't seem that way. How about you? What do you do now? I work at an oil company. Ah, right. I heard about that from someone. Well, good for you. You've always been smart and determined. Kim stood right next to him, complimenting Ethan and looking at him. The way she looked at him, there was so much in that gaze. Interest, admiration, warmth and tenderness. And here we are, celebrating a corporate event with my colleagues, Ethan explained, gesturing towards his table. That's great. How long are you planning to stay here? Ethan shrugged. It'll be a little less crowded at the end of the shift. Let's talk, okay? It's so nice to see someone from my childhood. It was the best time ever. Throughout the evening, Kim was busy going from table to table with trays, smiling at visitors and exchanging short phrases with them. Kim and Ethan often met eyes, and a warm wave of happiness flooded Ethan's heart at such moments. As Ethan's co-workers were leaving, he walked them to the cab. Why aren't you coming? Carl wondered. I'm going to stay a little longer. I see. Carl smiled conspiratorially. Is it because of the pretty girl with the tray you've been staring at all evening? Just don't forget that you have Nina. Carl left, and Ethan pondered his words. Nina, kind, intelligent, faithful, and reliable. It would surely be unpleasant for her to know that the man she was going to marry in the summer decided to linger in the bar, not just for fun with his colleagues, but to chat with his first love. On the other hand, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was simply curious to know how Kim ended up working as a waitress. As closing time approached, only a few people remained in the bar. Kim finally had a chance to sit down at Ethan's table. She looked a little tired, 
but for some reason that made her even more attractive. Oh, it's been a tough shift, she said, smiling at Ethan. Can I order something for you? No, thanks. I'll have to get it myself then. And I'd better sit here, my legs are buzzing. It's a requirement at our bar for waitresses to wear heels. They look good on you, Ethan said. Thank you, but a waitress uniform isn't something I'd want to wear, of course. Then why? Well, it might be my fate. You know, I got married right out of high school to Oscar, who I dated in high school. Well, it was like a fairy tale at first. I couldn't even believe that kind of life was possible. A huge apartment that looked like it came from an interior design magazine. A loving, handsome, caring husband who drove me everywhere in an expensive car and showered me with gifts. A credit card that was regularly topped up with substantial amounts of money, without me even having to ask. Travelling, my dream job. Oscar's father hired me as a secretary for a top manager in his firm. My only job was to record calls from people trying to reach the boss when he was out, and to make coffee for him a couple of times a day. That was it. I sat in a beautiful office, read novels, played games on my phone, painted my nails, and chatted with female co-workers. I changed outfits all the time. Going to work was like a runway show. I felt so beautiful, and the salary was more than decent. What about your studies? Didn't you enroll in any college? Oh, I was naive and a fool. I didn't even think about it back then. I had a beautiful, bright and full life. It seemed like it would always be that way. But as time went on, the always attentive and alert Oscar changed. He started working late and going on endless business trips, returning with a tan for some reason. I, engrossed in new acquaintances, work and shopping, and didn't notice it immediately. But when I realised that something was wrong, I became frightened. That's when I realised that my happiness was fragile and illusory, entirely dependent on Oscar's attitude towards me, his decisions and his plans. Oscar kept drifting away, and it drove me into a panic. I tried to fix the situation with luxury lingerie, culinary delights and unusual gifts for my spouse. I even broached the subject of having a child, although initially we had agreed not to have kids. However, Oscar remained indifferent to all my efforts and attempts to restore our previous relationship, except for when I brought up having a baby. That made him a little angry. He said that we weren't ready yet. Then one day, I got into his cell phone when he was in the bathroom. Usually, Oscar took his cell phone with him everywhere, but then he left the gadget on the table and I took advantage of it. And to my utter horror, I stumbled across my husband's correspondence with someone named Christina. It was clear that Christina was Oscar's mistress. The messages exchanged between Oscar and Christina were quite explicit. They included text messages interspersed with photos of Christina in revealing outfits, and there was even a video. When Oscar came out of the bathroom, I demanded an explanation. I expected that Oscar would try to justify himself, but he only shrugged his shoulders and said, What's the big deal? Only now have I realised that in Oscar's view of the world, having a mistress was a normal part of life. After all, Oscar's father behaved the same way, as did most of his father's friends. Men make money and do what they want. Women put up with everything and serve their husbands. Everyone has a role to play, he said to me, referring to what his father taught him a long time ago. At first, I was even willing to tolerate it for the sake of a comfortable life. But then I felt threatened by Christina. I tried to talk to my husband carefully without insulting him, but still letting him know that his behaviour was unacceptable. However, this tactic didn't work. One day, a scandal broke out. Oscar called things by their proper names, reminding me of where he had taken me from, and what I had gained from our union. He said that everything had a price. I felt worthless. No, I wasn't afraid of losing Oscar now. I was disgusted with him. He was a pompous peacock, proud of his parents' fortune. The only thing I didn't want to give up was my new life. 
the life I had already grown accustomed to, and so I resigned myself to it. At times I was disgusted with myself, but I continued to live with Oscar, pretending to be an exemplary wife and showing unearthly love when necessary. In return, I received unlimited amounts of money, but there was my second mistake. I didn't use them to start my own business or even buy a separate apartment. No, I squandered it all on momentary entertainment. Beautiful clothes, trips with girlfriends to expensive clubs, trips to the sea, luxury perfume, and similar pleasures that helped me distract myself and feel happy. And then one day, Oscar announced to me that we were getting a divorce, as if it were a minor matter. I found as if the ground had been pulled out from under me. I understood that I would have to return to my parents. All the jointly acquired property was registered in Oscar's father's name, which meant that after the divorce I would receive nothing. And the worst part is that I had no profession, no savings. Kim sighed sadly again. I'm sorry for being so frank with you. I'm just tired of keeping everything inside. And you've always been good, understanding, and wise beyond your years. It's a pleasure to talk to you like this. Ethan was silent and only looked at her with sympathy and love in his eyes. So Kim continued her story. I couldn't live with his parents. I sold some of my branded clothes and pawned jewellery, just enough to rent an apartment for six months. Then I went on a job hunt, because of course I was fired from my ex-father-in-law's firm. After a long search, I managed to find a job as a waitress at this bar. I like it here, Kim finally smiled. The music's good and the people are fun. It's enjoyable, even. I'm so sorry, Ethan said finally. It must be so hard for you. It's okay. It's a good thing we didn't have the opportunity to have children, or I would have been tied to him for life. Well, to hell with him. He always treated me condescendingly, as if he looked down on me. And to me, a naive and young fool at the time, it seemed like it was his care, his patronage, and his love. But it was nothing like that. His new wife will hardly be happy with him. So I'm even glad I got rid of him. Well, what about you? Kim looked into Ethan's eyes. Tell me about yourself. Do you have someone? No. Ethan lied for some reason. I don't have anyone. I'm single. He couldn't tell about Nina. Looking at Kim, he had neither the strength nor the will to do so. That evening they sat at a table near the wall, reminiscing about their past, joking and recalling mutual acquaintances. Ethan easily and naturally confessed to Kim how much he had been in love with her for several years. I wish I had known that. I was looking for sincere feelings and love, but the guys that were hanging around me, they just wanted one thing. I thought there was no other way. Then they walked around the city all night, not wanting to part. Ethan put his arm around Kim's shoulders, and she clung to him trustingly. She invited him to her place. Kim rented an apartment not far from the bar, and Ethan agreed. They spent the night together. Their first night. In the morning, Ethan felt truly happy because Kim was next to him. He felt an unprecedented surge of strength and a pleasant lightness of mind. This mood was not overshadowed even by the thought of Nina. He would talk to her, explain everything. Nina was smart, she would understand. Dreams must come true, otherwise life loses all meaning. Kim and Ethan started dating. He told her about Nina because he wanted to be sincere and honest with his beloved. Kim was clearly upset, tense and distrustful. This has happened to me before, she said in a slumped tone. There was a man in my life who promised he'd divorce me, but he didn't. We're in an entirely different situation, and Nina and I aren't even married. The conversation with Nina was long and arduous. Ethan sweated as if he had unloaded three cars of coal. Nina, who was usually calm and rational, became hysterical, sobbing, and begged Ethan to come to his senses. She even cursed him and Kim. 
Ethan's heart clenched with pain as he looked at his former fiancée. It seemed that Nina truly loved him. Later, Ethan heard from mutual acquaintances that Nina couldn't bear life without him and attempted to end her life. Fortunately, she was quickly found and saved. Nina spent some time in the hospital receiving treatment from psychiatrists. Because of this impulsive act, she lost her prestigious job. Ethan felt guilty about what happened to her, but how could he help her? You don't have to sacrifice your happiness and your dreams for another person. No one is obliged, Kim soothed her beloved. Immediately after Ethan's breakup with Nina, Kim moved in with him. They both didn't want to part and wanted to be constantly close to each other. Ethan offered Nina help through mutual friends, but she proudly refused. She no longer wanted to hear about her former fiancé. In the end, everything turned out well for Nina. Her health improved, she recovered at work, got married, and gave birth to two wonderful boys. Ethan was happy for Nina, and even tried to call her once to talk, but he realised that Nina now resented him, despite the years that had passed and the positive events in her life. Ethan and Kim also got married. The initial passion settled down a bit, and life took a calm course. Ethan rejoiced in his life, and believed that it would only get better from now on. Kim decided to quit her job. He considered himself not entitled to advise her to do so, but if she wanted to, well, Ethan only supported her. The man believed he could adequately provide for their small family. After Kim became a housewife, all at home became cosier, somehow at once. Now, when Ethan returned from work, the rooms were always tidy and smelled of delicious food. However, at some point, an unforeseen event occurred. The company where Ethan had worked for years went bankrupt due to intense competition. Suddenly, Ethan found himself unemployed. Of course, he received offers from other companies, but the salaries were three times lower than what he earned at his previous job. In general, the family had to cut back on expenses. Kim was accustomed to a lavish lifestyle, indulging in fitness clubs, spas, shopping, and cosmetology treatments. She dressed in brand clothes, dined with friends at restaurants, and enjoyed short trips to the sea multiple times a year. However, all of that came to a halt. Ethan was just concerned, but Kim, for her, the decline in their quality of life was a tragedy, and the worst part was that it wasn't just a temporary setback. Ethan had no prospects in this city. Kim tried to encourage Ethan to start his own business. Kim, what are you talking about? Entrepreneurship needs a different kind of character. I'm not like that, Ethan honestly responded. He couldn't see himself as a business leader. He didn't require mentality or strength. Instead, he excelled as a performer. Yeah, well, that requires a core, like an Oscar. Kim shook her head in disappointment. It hurt Ethan that he was compared unfavourably to Oscar, but he never reminded Kim that her ex-husband had dumped her. Since that conversation, Kim has refused to cook, clean, or do any housework, despite not having a job. I'm not a free maid, she declared to her husband in the evenings. Ethan sighed and went to the kitchen to prepare something for himself, pasta, sausages or fried eggs. He forgave Kim for her unfair reproaches and whims. He understood that she was going through a difficult time. He hoped that with time she would calm down. The most important thing for him was to preserve their relationship and avoid unnecessary conflicts. Then Kim informed Ethan that she was expecting a child. The father-to-be was overjoyed. However, Kim herself didn't seem thrilled and even considered getting rid of this unexpected pregnancy. Fortunately, Ethan managed to talk her out of it. The pregnancy was severe. Kim experienced discomfort, back pain, stomach pain and constant mood swings. In all her suffering, she blamed Ethan 
for not being able to provide enough for her and the baby. Ethan felt guilty, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't earn as much as he had before. His salary was already considered very good by the city's standards, but Kim wanted more. Ethan believed that after the birth of their child, Kim would change. Hormones often affect pregnant women, and things usually return to normal. But in their case, that didn't happen. When Ethan came home from work, he often encountered a distressing scene. Their daughter crying in her crib, while Kim sat in another room, wearing headphones and engrossed in social media conversations. Ethan tried to discuss the upbringing of their daughter delicately, avoiding offence. He emphasised the baby's need for her attention, warmth and care. "'Do you want to spoil her?' Kim used to say it angrily, narrowing her eyes. "'Are you saying we should take her in the arms every time she cries, fuss over her non-stop, and forget about ourselves?' "'No, of course not, but—' At this point, Kim would always interrupt him, bombarding Ethan with accusations that made him feel insignificant. Kim shouted that she needed rest. She had just given birth to a new life, enduring nine months of agony, followed by the demands of caring for the baby 24-7, without any assistance or the opportunity to take even a day off. "'You can't send me to the sea for a week. We can't afford it. You can't hire a nanny, so I can pursue my own interests. You have no right to dictate my actions, so just shut up.' Kim's voice and expression were filled with hatred and contempt, leaving Ethan at a loss for words, and unable to comfort his beloved. He felt like a complete failure. It was painful to realise that his beloved saw him as a miserable loser. He remembered how kind and friendly Kim used to be when they had more financial stability. He blamed himself for not being able to provide adequately for his beloved and daughter, as their relationship crumbled. Every day, after returning from work, Ethan willingly took on household chores, cooking, cleaning and playing with his daughter. He even enjoyed it. Then Ethan hired a nanny to relieve some of the burden on his wife. However, Kim remained dissatisfied even with this. She did not get along with the nanny, who didn't hesitate to point out her shortcomings in dealing with her own child, so they had to part ways with her. The next nanny was less talkative and more indifferent. Kim breathed a sigh of relief as she finally gained some freedom. She met with friends, went shopping, and indulged in spa treatments. Although she couldn't live life to the fullest as before, Ethan made sure that there was always money available for her entertainment. He understood that women on maternity leave needed occasional relaxation. However, Kim's behaviour became more and more far from normal. The woman became increasingly distant from both Haley and Ethan, living her own life. She only came home to sleep, occasionally showing up in the morning in an intoxicated state. Ethan believed that all this trouble was a temporary thing. He still loved her and hoped that her behaviour was simply some kind of postpartum depression. However, by the time Haley was almost a year old, not much had changed. Ethan often observed the behaviour of other women when he walked with Haley or accompanied her to clinics. He noticed how mothers looked at their babies, caring for them with infinite tenderness. Haley never experienced any of that. Her mother was cold and indifferent, only touching her when necessary and never playing, singing or reciting poems to her. Ethan tried to start a business, believing that financial stability would improve Kim's state of mind. However, his attempts failed, and he ended up losing his savings. He also considered inviting Kim to see a family psychologist. He even found an excellent specialist, but he was afraid of her resistance. However, before he had a chance to discuss it with his wife, an event occurred that drastically changed everything. One day, Ethan was delayed at work and returned home later than usual, Kim was still not home. The nanny, a kind woman who endured irregular working hours without complaint, was taking care of Haley. Ethan let the nanny go and quickly prepared dinner for himself. Haley was already fast asleep in her crib. 
Ethan entered the bedroom he shared with Kim and looked around. His heart sank, sensing trouble. Something was wrong. Finally, he realized. There were much fewer of Kim's things. He harshly opened his wife's drawer. Many items were missing, including the jewellery he had given her when they were more financially stable, her favourite branded dresses and other cherished possessions. Kim hadn't taken everything, but only the most beloved and valuable items. Clearly their daughter was not on that list. And then Ethan found a note in the kitchen cupboard that explained everything. It turned out that Kim had met George, a businessman from Germany on social networks. Their non-committal correspondence quickly turned into something more serious. It turned out that George had even visited Kim several times, and they had spent time together, falling more and more in love with each other, and making plans for the future. In the note, Kim said that she had filed for divorce and given up to their daughter. Ethan felt as if the ground was slipping from under his feet. Forgive me. It's as if I never existed in your life. Haley. do whatever you want with her. Raise her yourself or put her in an orphanage. You're also free to give her up and start a new life. She was a big mistake, and I guess our marriage was too. When we met by chance in a bar, I thought there might be something between us, but it didn't work out. We're totally different. We're not right for each other but I still wish you personal happiness. Be as happy as I am. That was all. That was the end of the letter. Ethan couldn't believe that Kim was really like that. A real monster, cold and calculating. How could she even suggest giving Haley to an orphanage? Before, Ethan thought that Kim would come to her senses, recover and become the same nice, caring, cheerful and understanding woman she used to be. After all, their financial difficulties were not so heavy. They couldn't spend money as freely as before, but they had everything they needed and more. Finally, Ethan could admit to himself that Kim had only been with him because of his money. Back then, she was distressed and was looking for someone who could lift her out of poverty, support her, and take care of all her financial issues. And she found such a person. Kim was happy for a while, taking advantage of Ethan, who was deeply in love with her. But when he lost his high-paying job and the family's wealth declined, she started looking for another option. After that day, Kim never appeared in Ethan's life again. The man knew she was now living in Germany. He saw a photo of her on her social network page and even tried to contact her, but he was immediately blocked. Ethan thought that eventually she would feel remorse for the child, but it never happened. The man suffered for Kim until fate abruptly shifted his focus to another problem. Haley was suddenly diagnosed with a rare blood disease. It's all genetics, the doctor explained. It would have happened sooner or later anyway. Haley was only four years old at the time. Endless examinations and uninterrupted treatment began. At first, Ethan thought that they would easily find the right therapy to stabilise her condition. He believed that medicine was now advanced enough to help his daughter. However, Haley had a very rare and insidious disease that was constantly deteriorating her blood. The little girl felt tired all the time. After all these years, Ethan tried to reach out to his ex-wife again. She had already married George, and they even had a little son, Haley's half-brother. Judging by the photos Ethan sometimes saw on social networks, Kim was a very devoted mother to this child. It gave him hope that now Kim would realise how important she was to their little girl. Maybe she would not be indifferent to the news of her daughter's illness and could help Haley in some way. Perhaps they could find a German doctor who would prescribe a new treatment and Haley would recover. However, Kim categorically did not want to communicate with her former husband, and Ethan was able to tell her about what happened to Haley through one of her old girlfriends only. She asked me to tell you to forget about her existence. These words were said to Ethan by the same friend. She asks you to act as if she never existed in your life at all. 
that's what she said. After this conversation, Ethan realized that he would have to rely only on himself. There was no hope for Kim anymore. And so Ethan continued to fight for the health of his beloved daughter on his own. No one was closer or dearer to him than her. Ethan could not let her down. Haley grew up to be a kind and smiling girl. Despite her illness, she tried to find joy in life. Ethan was constantly amazed by the simple things that brought delight to his child. A butterfly frozen on a bright yellow leaf. The dance of snowflakes in the air. A sly cat approaching a flock of pigeons. Daddy, it's so beautiful, look! The little girl would point her tiny finger at something that had never evoked any feelings or emotions in Ethan before. And he saw that, yes, his daughter was right. These were truly wonderful things, worth admiring. Ethan tried to spend every free minute with his daughter. He enjoyed listening to her thoughts and making plans for the future together. Haley dreamed of becoming an artist and travelling the world with her exhibitions. Looking at her drawings, Ethan realised that it was quite possible. The little girl clearly had talent. He even enrolled her in an art class, but she couldn't attend due to her illness, just like she couldn't go to kindergarten. The insidious disease had weakened her, making her susceptible to infections. But Ethan found a solution. He started inviting the drawing teacher to their home, and she immediately liked Haley. Well, it was hard not to be charmed by this radiant little girl. Ethan worked hard, but Haley's treatment, or rather, keeping her alive, was not cheap. However, she did not get better. The doctors were at a loss. What do you expect? Ethan heard from them. The disease is rare and poorly studied. Genetics is always complicated. Unfortunately, your daughter drew the short straw at birth. All the doctors said more or less the same thing. There are only a few specialists in the world studying this disease. The lines to see them are miles long. The treatment is expensive, because each case is unique and requires extensive scientific study. Some patients achieve remission, but others find no relief. Ethan knew the names of all the doctors studying the disease that were slowly but surely killing his daughter. There were only two in the country, Dr. Dumond and Dr. Campbell. Both lived and worked in the capital, and getting an appointment with either of them was impossible. The queues were massive, and even just a consultation with these medical stars would require Ethan to take out a loan. Moreover, their schedules were booked a year in advance. Ethan was constantly told to call back in a couple of months. He called almost every week, but always received the same answer. There are no available appointments. Call back in a month or two. Maybe something will open up. Ethan felt devastated and powerless as he looked at his daughter. Haley was fading away every day, growing weaker and paler. Shadows appeared under her large turquoise eyes, just like her mother's. It was unbearable to watch. Ethan took a vacation from work and took Haley to the Hematology Centre in the capital, where she would receive a maintenance course. Although this didn't provide a definite cure, it gave the girl some time. Ethan clenched his teeth, hoping for months and years of life for his daughter. She had to wait for treatment. However, even dedicated doctors who have spent their lives fighting such diseases might not be able to help. Ethan knew this well, but he had to try, in case Haley happened to be one of the lucky ones who recovered. There were chances and not insignificant ones. He just had to find a way to reach these doctors. Every morning, Ethan would take his daughter to the clinic for the necessary procedures. Afterwards, he would bring her back to the rented apartment. Ethan hoped that after the treatment, his daughter would feel better. This had happened before. Haley would fall ill, be hospitalised, receive shots, medicine, drips, and blood transfusions, and undergo either complex and undoubtedly painful medical procedures. And for a while, Haley would recover, even gaining weight. Her cheeks would regain their pink colour, and her movements would become lively. Ethan had hoped for the same outcome this time, but it didn't work. Haley remained weak and indifferent, 
as usual. She even stopped drawing because it was difficult for her to hold pencils and brushes. She spent all day lying in bed. Ethan asked the doctors questions, but they just waved their hands and explained that the disease takes its toll, and this is what happens to children like Haley sooner or later. They can only act on instructions. In her case, she needed experimentation, an individual approach, and targeted help. It all came down to the fact that the girl needed to see Dr. Campbell or Dr. Dumond as soon as possible. Ethan tried to have his daughter admitted to the hospital for round-the-clock observation by medical professionals. Her condition was worsening. And your daughter doesn't have any urgent indications, replied the doctors. Her condition is stable for now and doesn't require emergency treatment. Suddenly, Ethan realized that if he didn't see with any of the doctors while he and Haley were in the capital, if he took his daughter home after rehabilitation, nothing would help Haley. This thought filled him with fever, and Ethan decided, no, he would not leave empty-handed. He would find these doctors no matter what it took. He is ready to break into their homes, wait for them after work, and even sneak into the operating room, but force one of them to treat Haley. Even if he has to face consequences for his actions, he will get what he wants after all. And now Ethan was sitting on a bench in the park, across the street from where the hospital where Dr. Dumond worked. Dr. Campbell was out of the country, attending an international conference. Ethan knew what this doctor looked like, a middle-aged man slightly older than him with with dark hair, attentive brown eyes, well-defined cheekbones, a straight nose and a strong chin. It was not the first day that Ethan had been waiting for Dr. Dumond outside the clinic. He always waited until Haley fell asleep and then took up his position. Unfortunately, he couldn't stay away for long because he didn't want to leave Haley all alone, but as long as she was asleep, he could keep waiting for the doctor. The desperate father was willing to do anything, Anxious thoughts swirled in his head. In recent days, anger, hatred and envy of the parents of healthy children have consumed Ethan's soul. Ethan was grappling with his own emotions. He had always considered himself to be a good person. However, in his current situation, he was willing to do terrible things just to save Haley. If need be, he'd even take Dr. Dumond hostage if it helps his daughter. Why do you look so sad? Ethan was startled by a clear melodious voice that interrupted his gloomy thoughts. Why do you look so sad? Ethan was startled by a clear melodious voice that interrupted his gloomy thoughts. He turned around to find a little boy sitting beside him on the bench. The child, who appeared to be around seven years old, had big blue eyes, a button nose speckled with freckles, and a curious expression. His shaggy blonde hair wanted a trim, but there was something endearing about it. The boy seemed to come from a caring, yet financially struggling family. His clothes were outdated, likely passed down from another child, and his sneakers were dusty and well-worn. However, his shirt was clean and pressed. "'Why are you sad?' the boy asked again. "'Oh, it's nothing. I'm just lost in thought,' Ethan replied." No, I can see that, but don't worry, everything will be all right. Sometimes things start off bad, but they eventually get better. The boy reassured the man. You're right, Ethan smiled. It was impossible not to smile when looking into those clear blue eyes. There was an innocence and brightness in the boy who radiated a special energy. Why are you wandering around here all by yourself? Where are your parents? Ethan looked around concerned that such a young child was walking alone without much caution. It wasn't proper for a child of his age to approach and strike up a conversation with a stranger. I'm alone today. My grandma is sick, so I came here to see my friend. He waits for me every day. We help each other, the boy explained. It sounds like you and your friend have a genuine bond, Ethan remarked with a smile. Keep that friendship alive. It's rare to find such a connection. I know, the boy replied with a smile. His missing front teeth made his smile both amusing and endearing. He was a remarkable child, 
speaking so confidently and naturally. So your grandmother is sick and your parents are probably at work. Is that why you're here alone? Does your grandma know where you are? Or did you leave without telling her? Ethan inquired. She knows. Don't worry, I'm a big boy. I understand everything. And I know how to be cautious around strangers. The boy reassured him. What about me? Ethan asked in surprise. I'm a stranger to you, yet you're talking to me. You seem like a good person, the boy replied innocently. I can tell from the way you look. Ethan's eyes welled up with tears. The child's trust and innocent were heartwarming. He referred to Ethan as good, unaware of the heavy thoughts weighing on his mind. Ethan was willing to commit a crime for the sake of his daughter, yet this boy saw goodness in him. Nevertheless, you should be cautious about strangers. People can be unpredictable, you know. Your parents must have told you that, Ethan cautioned. They didn't, the boy shook his head. I don't know my parents. I don't even remember them. My grandma takes care of me. My parents died when I was very young. They were in a car accident. I was in the car too, but I survived without any injuries. My grandmother always says that the angels saved me because I still have to grow up and make this world a better place. My name is Travis, by the way, and you? I'm Ethan. As they continued their conversation, a woman in a green coat rolled a cart filled with freshly baked goods past them. Ethan couldn't help but notice the longing look Travis gave the cart. It dawned on him that the boy came from a visibly poor family and must be hungry. Travis, did you have breakfast today? Ethan asked, concern evident in his face. A friend of mine gave me a sandwich, but it was a long time ago, the boy said. He was obviously hungry, but he didn't dare to ask due to his modesty and shyness. Ethan caught up with the saleswoman and bought two puffy buns with raisins. He handed one to Travis, who immediately devoured it like a hungry wolf. It was a delight to watch the child's appetite for the bun, especially after Ethan's unsuccessful attempt to feed Haley porridge all morning. She hadn't eaten anything recently. And the second bun for you? Travis asked. Why don't you eat it? It's delicious. No, it's for my daughter, Ethan replied. He thought that maybe Haley would like to try at least a piece of the flavorful pastry. He would be happy if she could eat even a quarter of it. Wow, you have a daughter. What's her name? How old is she? Haley. She just turned six. Why didn't you take her to the park? The weather is so nice. We could have gone for a walk or a run. You see, Travis, Haley is sick. A fever? The naive kid asked. He probably doesn't know that there are worse diseases in the world. No, it's more serious than that. I wish she only had a fever. Unfortunately, it's something blood-related. Something hematologic. Ethan stared at the child in amazement. How would he know such words? It didn't match the image of a snuggle-toothed, toothless boy. Wow! How do you know such things? My friend knows a lot about diseases. He tells me sometimes, Travis explained. You know, your daughter needs fresh air and positive emotions. I agree, Ethan sighed. Travis surprised him more and more. But Haley is too weak to walk in the park. Then let me visit her at your place. Do you live far away? I want to be a doctor when I grow up. I already know how to make Grandma feel better when I put my hand on her forehead. And your Grandma won't mind if you visit strangers? She won't, assured the little fellow. She knows I'm good at judging people, and I can spot the bad ones from a mile away. Ethan thought for a moment. On one hand, this wonderful boy was right. Haley really needed positive emotions. Ethan didn't know how to please his daughter. She showed no interest in toys and cartoons. She couldn't eat chocolate or sweets, and she lacked communication with other children. And here is Travis with his tempting offer. Ethan realized he might get into trouble for it. However, he decided to take the risk for the sake of Haley. Travis was radiant, open and sensitive. If this little boy would bring even a little joy to Haley, it meant that Ethan's risk was worth it. When Ethan and Travis entered the apartment, Haley was no longer asleep. 
she was lying on the bed, staring blankly at the ceiling. When she saw the unfamiliar boy her father had brought, the girl became slightly animated, her eyes lighting up with interest. "'Who is this?' she asked, raising herself on her elbows. "'It's me, Travis,' the boy introduced himself. "'Your dad and I have become friends. I've come to visit you.' "'And I'm Haley. "'I know. Ethan's told me. "'I know you're sick.' "'Yes,' the girl nodded sadly. "'Well, don't worry. "'Doctors are good now. "'They can cure everything. "'You know, when I grow up, "'I want to be a doctor too. "'And I want to be an artist. "'Are you good at drawing?' "'Yes,' Haley answered proudly. "'Ethan was pleased to hear her voice.' Previously, his daughter had been indifferent to everything, but suddenly she joined the conversation so vividly. "'Dad, take out my folder with drawings. I'll show Travis.' Travis climbed onto the blanket next to Haley, and she began to show him her masterpieces. Travis looked at the drawings with interest, and Haley told him something about each one. They were clearly enjoying their time together. Ethan smiled at his daughter's enthusiasm and went into the kitchen in this space. He decided to take a moment to prepare something for dinner. Perhaps with Travis around, Haley would eat well too. Occasional childish laughter could be heard from the room. It was surprising because Haley had rarely smiled lately. An hour later, Ethan walked Travis back to his house. It wasn't far from their apartment, just an old five-story building behind the park. Haley's very sick. Travis said sadly on the way home. I'll ask my friend how to cure her. He will help. He's smart, you know. Ethan only smiled. A naive little boy. He probably thinks that his friend, who is most likely a little older than he is, and who has watched a medical program, is intelligent. It's funny, but sad, too. Can I come to you tomorrow, too? Of course, Ethan smiled. At the same time, you don't have to come earlier. Haley will be at the hospital. OK, I'll definitely come. You'll help me a lot if you babysit her once I'm away on business. Ethan suddenly realised that while they had Travis around, he would have more time to catch Dr. Dumond. I'll definitely sit with Haley. She's such a good girl. Not like Megan, a troublemaker from the neighbourhood. Haley really does draw beautifully. The next day, Travis kept his promise and appeared at the appointed hour. Haley was already waiting for him. The girl had prepared a board game that she thought would please her new friend. Ethan left the kids and went to the clinic, but again Dr. Dumond never showed up. In the end, Ethan had to return to the apartment. Haley was asleep again. When Ethan came back, he noticed that she was even paler than usual. She's getting worse. Travis looked up at Ethan with despair in his eyes. "'Can I come with my friend tomorrow? He will definitely help her. He's the smartest and kindest person in the world.' "'Of course. Of course, come with your friend,' Ethan allowed, upset by his daughter's condition and another failed attempt. "'The more, the merrier. Haley will be happy to meet your friend.' "'You too,' Travis promised. "'You'll be happy with him too. You'll see.' The next day started as usual. Ethan woke his daughter up and attempted to feed her some porridge and fruit. Haley managed to eat a couple of spoonfuls and refused the rest. The little girl kept asking her father when Travis would arrive. However, the boy was running late. Ethan had already concluded that his new friend wouldn't visit them that day. Maybe his grandmother wouldn't allow it, or perhaps he got caught up playing with someone and forgot. Travis was so sociable. He had countless friends everywhere. However, the long-awaited doorbell finally came. I wonder if Travis is alone, or if he has come with a friend as he intended, Ethan thought, and opened the door. On the doorstep stood a boy with a wide smile, followed by a restless grown man. And not just any man. It was Dr. Dumond. Ethan could barely maintain his composure, from the surge of emotions. What was happening? How was this possible? Hello, Ethan, said Travis. Meet my friend, Dr. Dumond. Remember, you aren't allowed to come with him. He's here to help Haley. 
Two years had passed since that incredible day. Ethan was back at the capital, in the same park, near the same bench. Only now it was spring, the middle of April. The greenery had just sprouted, the sky was clear and blue, and the sunshine was warm and bright. Ethan sat on the bench, observing Travis and Haley. The children were drawing on the sidewalk and playing around. Both had grown a lot during this time, becoming more mature. Travis was almost a teenager now. He still had the same open eyes and charming smile, but he had become taller, stronger and more resilient. It was a relief that the boy hadn't lost his spontaneity and openness. He would probably remain that way forever, kind, attentive and sensitive. Haley was already eight. Two years ago, Ethan never imagined that his daughter would attend a regular school. At best, he had expected homeschooling, and at worst, Ethan didn't want to think about it now, now that everything was behind them. She beat me again! Ethan, she beat me again! Travis's voice was filled with admiration. Haley smiled proudly, and Ethan grinned. He understood that Travis always let Haley win, making her feel strong and agile. The boy knew that she needed positive emotions and self confidence. So he tried his best. He acted as if he were at least ten years older than Haley, a little sage. On that memorable day, Ethan could hardly believe that Dr. Dumond himself was Travis's friend. Yes, the boy had mentioned several times that his friend knew about medicine, but he had never imagined that he was one of the two most famous doctors in the country. Dr. Dumond turned out to be a very kind and pleasant person. Ethan shared his troubles with him. While the men were talking, the children resumed playing that same board game in the bedroom. Dumond became horrified at the difficulty people had in getting an appointment with him. He was completely unaware of the situation. As a result, he decided to create his own website immediately, allowing patients to contact him directly. Haley was taken into the clinic where Dumond worked. After a thorough and detailed examination, the doctor developed the necessary treatment plan. It was quite expensive, but Dumond personally secured government subsidies for the girl, and she began to recover immediately. Unfortunately, it was not possible to completely cure the disease. Haley will have to take medication for the rest of her life, but from now on, she will be no different from other healthy children. Haley started school on time, attending both regular and art schools. Every year she had to go to the capital for rehabilitation and examinations. Both the daughter and the father were happy about this, as they looked forward to seeing Travis, a wonderful boy who played a significant role in Haley's life. You might be interested in how Travis and Dr. Dumond became friends considering they came from different backgrounds. Travis met Dr. Dumond at the hospital where his grandmother was admitted. The little boy was anxious about the only native person, cried and could not calm down in any way. Dumond was the only person who managed to help Travis. During this time, Travis's grandmother was in critical condition. When the danger passed, Dr. Dumond shared the good news with Travis. By that point, the boy and the man had developed an incredible friendship. Travis informed his new friend that he aspired to become a doctor, giving them even more interesting topics to discuss. Dr. Dumond was moved by Travis's story. He didn't want the boy to be in an orphanage while his grandmother was ill, so he took him in. His wife gladly welcomed Travis as a guest. They already had a son of the same age, and the boys got along well. From then on, Travis visited Dr. Dumond. Despite his busy schedule, the man never refused to spend time with the boy and actively participated in his life, understanding that it was difficult for the elderly woman to care for her grandson alone. When Travis tearfully told Dr. Dumond about Haley, he couldn't remain indifferent. With time, Ethan and Dr. Dumond also developed a friendly relationship. The doctor personally ensured that Haley received all the necessary procedures. Sometimes they would discuss other topics, but most often 
they discussed Travis. His fate now mattered to both of them. What a wonderful boy, Ethan exclaimed. I wish I had a son like him. Intelligent and, most importantly, empathetic, Dumond agreed. The ideal combination for a future doctor. He will save more than one life.